last but not least, I'm going to give you guidelines for training such networks, as well as commenting a little bit about learning guarantees and alternatives to train those networks so that you, um, in, in more, in case when you have limited annotated data. So how to train them? We are going. To, we we are using uh, stochastic gradient descent. So we have to um, w to study the mini batch size. As I said, the default is around 16, but more might be used to speed up the process. If you some, uh, and this is a um, um, compromise between memory and speed. If we want something that is more accurate. Often we use a lar uh, smaller batch size. However, this uh, requires lots of time, and and then we want to increase that. So sometimes increasing the batch size is good. However, it may not fit into the memory, so you have to decrease it. So we always want to find a sweet spot in this case. Always, uh, you have to look into the loss values. So. Um, as you go through the training process, make um, um, store the the loss values, both for the training loss and also if you, if it's possible a validation loss. What is a validation loss? Is a a set of instances, a small set of instances that you just um, you just use to to follow the training and they were not using for use it for training usually people take like five percent of the training set and separate it to use as a validation to see if the training is not uh, doing something that is far from something that is unseen and then use plots so plot the curves to see if this loss is really falling as was it was expected to do also adjust the learning rate so learning rate is a parameter that allows us to define how fast the algorithm will run in terms of going into the descent of the, gra the gradient descent so the larger the running rate the faster we'll try to find the valley of the the functions the smaller the step will be very small, uh, but it will um, probably going to be a better estimate. So adjust the learning rate. Usually decay is used. So this learning rate starts with a number and decays over time for smoother conver conversions. So let's say I'm, I, I start with this point here and I want to find the minima of this, of this function. So with a fixed small step, I'm going to require, let's say, one, two, three, four steps, and then I'm going to stop here with a fairly good uh, estimate. If I exaggerate, and let's say I'm going to use a large step to make it quicker, the effect might be this one. So instead of smoothly go going to the, um, the minima, I'm probably going to past the point and if I do that well in here I want uh, I compute the derivative and it tells me to go in that direction and if I use a large step then I I just pass the point here the minima if I compute the gradient here it tells me to go back so I go back here and now it tells me to go um, to the other direction and then in the end, I'm just skipping what I really wanted that was the minima. So do not use a very large step. Decaying step is good also because I start with a larger step and then as I go near the, the minima, I start to make very small steps in order to not um, to not pass the point that I want to achieve. Also, instead of uh, we we do have the regular stochastic gradient descent, which is a good method and it can be used. 
and then uh, if you use that usually the learning rate is a little bit larger than for other methods that I'm going to mention and to define a proper decay learning rate there are other optimizers that uses other uh, they, co they compute not only the gradient but other information to assist in the process of the optimization but those are usually better with a much smaller learning rate so um, make sure you you um, you at least know some of the optimizer but do not use them um, blindly please uh, at least try to see what they are doing and make um, um, thoughtful choices in this sense it is paramount to use clean data that means if I use uh, data that has label errors or that are not very um, informative of the classes I'm probably not going to be to have good results if I have the data set that is not very large I can use data augmentation that means generating new examples by uh, by doing perturbations on the image for, for example I can get one training image and create a new one by applying noise on that image so I have now two images one noise free and one noisy image I can also apply affine transformations or geometric transformations rotate the image a little bit shift the content of the image crop and zoom the image so everything that we some some of the things that we learn on the um, on the previous lectures I can also sharpen the image using some kind of restoration so uh, virtually starting from one image I can multiply this image with by generating many images um, that are uh, variations of the original one and then with this procedure I can augment the data set another thing that's uh, helpful is to use a technique called dropout this technique randomly turns off a percentage of the neurons during training what it's uh, basically doing is that it, it's kind of like um, hiding some specific neurons so so that the neurons do not over specialize that means uh, let's say in one iteration a neuron 3 is deactivated if this neuron 3 is deactivated the other neurons will have to in some sense make um, uh, make up for it and then I'm learning in, with using dropout I'm learning how to compensate from the fact that some neurons might be wrong it can be seen as a bootstrap technique from statistics and it prevents memorization so it prevents every neuron to memorize the training instance batch normalization is also used so it's basically a z-score normalization over all data that means that before using the batch of images that matrix that is uh, uh, it, that has all the images what I'm going to do is compute the mean of all pixels and the standard deviation and I'm going to subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation this is performed before or after each layer and um, for deep networks it is employed before every block of uh, in this case for the inception before the inception block in the residual before the residual block and then um, but this process is costly so you start by using back normalization on the input layer and then if needed you can use on subsequent layers so just to uh, give you a little bit of uh, information about the learning guarantees so when we go to the statistical learning theory to see if some classification algorithm has guarantees we have two types of errors let's say this box here contains all functions 
that are possible to be used to classify. And this star here is the perfect classifier, so the best as possible classifier. If we define a what we call strong bias, this means that I'm just drawing functions from a restrict type of functions, let's say linear functions. So if I use just the linear functions, this circle here is a small circle. So I'm just allowed to, to find linear functions. If I start, if I have a guess, I start guess here. So this uh, fi here is a function that I, I choose. We have an estimation error, and this estimation error is the difference between the classifier and the best classifier within this circle. This is the estimation error. And the best classifier difference from the best classifier in all functions is the approximation error. And there is a relationship between a strong bias and a weak bias. A strong bias will have a large approximation error and a small estimation error. That means a random guess here I'm going to, it's going to be easier to find the best classifier in the circle because the circle is smaller. If I increase the size of the circle, it will be harder to find this best classifier here. So I'm probably going to be, um, to be very costly to, to come from this first estimate to this one. So the estimation error is large and the approximation error is usually smaller. In this case uh, we have a weak bias. This means the space of functions is wider. And this would be something that we can use to compare. A restrict bias would be a linear classifier. We just want a hyperplane or a plane or a, a line to separate regions of the, of the space. And this would be a neural network. So a large, much large space of functions. So we have a much large number of parameters to be learned. Then this is the problem. Uh, this requires not only lots of time, but lots of data as well. So important things to, be, to uh, keep in mind. Do I have the enough training examples? So this is something, if we don't have enough training examples, you cannot train a CNN architecture. What is the minimum sample size to ensure convergence? What is the generalization bound? So how does the training generalize for future data? So this is uh, the problem with deep learning and CNNs in general. Uh, it's uh, At first it looks like it is going to solve all the problems However, there are many concerns regarding how it generalizes, so how a network that is already learned uh, will generalize for future data, and how we can rely on them, really. In 2018, um, Gary Marcos wrote an um, essay saying that systems that rely on deep learning frequently have to generalize beyond specific data and the ability of formal proofs to guarantee that is more limited. Other uh, work show that CNNs are easily fooled when I can generate images that, um, that will comp for which the CNNs completely fail. For example, this image here is an owl. It is the original image. The CNN predicts it as an owl with 73% of confidence. But if I add just the gradient or the gradient of another animal, let's say a, a cheetah, 5% of those creates, and, and I sum with the owl, because it's just 5% is visually imperceptible. However, now the network classifies this as a cheetah with 99% of confidence. So maybe the network is learning something that's not visual for us as it is visual for the CNN.
and this is a problem. So this led to another work uh, by Zhang et al., uh, in which they observed that some CNNs can easily fit a random labeling of the training data. That means if I give the network sufficient examples, it can have zero training a data training error or near zero training error for random labels, which is really uh, something that should not happen. Anyway, so those are the concerns. So uh, do not just start using them before knowing where you want to go and the limitations of it. So if I have limited annotated data, but I want to use deep learning because, you know, everyone is using it. So what should I do? Well, we have to recur to pre-trained networks. If I have a data set with 100 images, 500 images, 1000 images, mm, it is too small for a deep network. So I'm going to get a network that was pre-trained using a very large data set, such as, such as the ImageNet, for example. And then I can perform two different approaches, fine-tuning or off-the-shelf feature extraction. What it means to fine-tune? Well, if I have a um, target data set, I start with a network that was already trained at using ImageNet. So the weights are already learned for ImageNet. What I do is I resume the process of training, but I freeze the beginning layers. So I don't allow those layers to adapt. I just redefine the final layers. I, I, um, I'm allowing those last layers to adapt while freezing the other ones. If the data is very unsimilar to ImageNet, because ImageNet is basically photographs, but if I have another domain, let's say um, medical image or any other domain, satellite image, this requires to adapt more layers. This requires also more, da more data, more images, but it must be, uh, it um, must, sometimes it is necessary. So I freeze less layers and let those adapt. But I'm not going from random layers, this is the important thing. I'm going. I'm starting with pre-trained weights. This um, diminishes the need for a huge amount of training data. But if I just have, let's say that I have 100 images, so this is uh, uh, it's small even for fine-tuning. So I can perform feature extraction. So I'm going to rely on a neural network that was pre-trained on any data set, I'm going to input the data and get the activation values, not of the output, because the output are ImageNet classes. So I'm going to take the outputs of any one of those layers. And then, because this is often very high in dimensionality, I can apply some dimensionality reduction technique. So, as such as PCA or product quantization, we didn't see those in the lecture in the, in the previous lectures here. But if you um, do some research, it's not hard to find uh, ways to implement those. Basically, what they allow is to go, let's say, for from five, uh, so from um, four thousand and ninety-six to thirty or sixteen features, a smaller version. And then we can use a stir external classifier, such as SVM, random forest, neural neural neighbors, and uh, sorry, um, nearest neighbors, and so on. So to conclude, uh, recall that deep learning is not something that will solve everything. It's not a silver bullet. It has low interpretability. So everything that's learned at those deep networks, we do not really know what is texture, what is color, what is shape. We just know that works. So in this case, uh, people often use this term um, 
I'm uh, I don't like that very much but what is often used is a black box so it's a black box you input something and you get something that at the output and you don't know what happens inside there are important concerns about generalization of those deep networks however those methods can be really useful for finding representations useful representations there are many challenges and many research frontiers for more complex tasks so if you're interested um, it's a field that is worth pursuing finally I'm going to give you some references for the part that studies learning guarantees and the estimation and the approximation errors and then for machine learning in general this is uh, one book that can be used as reference and then for deep learning in general, there is a book chapter that is written in Portuguese, a tutorial in English and some code that is available at the GitHub platform.